Section 61 of The Haunted Homes and Family Traditions of Great Britain. Rainham, the seat of the Marquis Townshend in Northfolk, has long been noted for its ghost known as the Brown Lady. Mrs. Crow and many other writers on apparitions and kindred themes have alluded to the circumstance of this family residence being haunted by a spectral woman, but their references are very slight and the particulars they give are exceedingly meager. Mrs. Crow indeed mentions that many persons have seen the brown lady and speaks of a guest who one day inquired of his host, who is that lady in brown that he had met frequently on the stairs? But the most circumstantial account of the appearance of this apparition would appear to be that given by Lucia C. Stone in Rifts in the Veil. This record, she states, she received from an eyewitness and as proof of its authenticity, draws attention to the fact that the names of all parties concerned are given in full. The time of the incidents, however, cannot be given any nearer than between 1835 and 1849. According to this narrative, a large party had assembled at Rainham in order to pass the Christmas there. Lord and Lady Charles Townshend were the host and hostess on this occasion, and among the assembled guests were Colonel and Mrs. Loftus and Miss Page, a cousin of the latter. Colonel Loftus was a brother of Lady Charles and a cousin to Lord Charles, being a Townshend on his mother's side. There was a tradition in the Townshend family that at certain intervals the apparition of a lady attired in brown brocade had been flitting about the building, but nothing had occurred for some long time past, and the old stories respecting the hauntings had been well nigh forgotten. One night, Colonel Loftus and a gentleman named Hawkins sat up rather late over a game of chess. They went upstairs and were bidding each other good night, when Mr. Hawkins exclaimed, Loftus, who is that standing at your sister's door? How strangely she is dressed! Colonel Loftus, who was nearsighted, put up his glass and followed the figure, which went on for some little distance when he lost sight of it. A second night she appeared to him, and this time, to prevent her escape, he went up a staircase, which would bring him face to face with her. There, in a full light, stood a stately lady in her rich brocade, a sort of coit on her head, the features clearly defined but where there should have been eyes were nothing but dark hollows. These were the two appearances he described to me, says Lucia Stone, and he sketched her afterwards. I saw the sketch just after his return from Rainham. The lady was seen by several others, and I have heard stories, but not from their own lips, so I forbear to give them. But perhaps I should mention that the cousin of Mrs. Loftus, Miss Page, whom I know very intimately, asked Lord Charles if he too believed in the apparition. He replied, I cannot but believe, for she ushered me into my room last night. The servants were frightened, and one after the other gave warning. Lord Charles Townshend, thinking that perhaps, after all, it might be a trick on the part of someone in the house, had various alterations made in the way of bolts, locks, and so forth. This proving to be useless, he engaged some of the London police force to come down and made them assume his livery, but they were unable to discover anything during their stay at Rainham. There does not seem to be any known legend connected with the appearance of the apparition of the Brown Lady. Section 62. Ramhurst Manor House. When the complicated developments of the tale connected with this Kentish manor house are known, it must be acknowledged that the affair is one of the most mysterious on record. Robert Dale Owen, from whose singular work, Footfalls on the Boundary of Another World, this strange story is extracted, does not furnish the actual names of the ladies from whom he derived his information about the haunting of Ramhurst, but veils their identity under initials, 
And as we have no other authority for the account other than his, it will be necessary in this instance to follow his example. Ramhurst Manor House, it must be premised, is an ancient residence near Lye in Kent. In October 1857, and for several subsequent months, it was occupied by Mrs. R., the wife of an English officer of high rank, and her servants. From the time this lady first occupied the place, she and every inmate were disturbed by knockings, unaccountable voices, and the sounds of mysterious footsteps. The strange voices were generally, but not invariably, heard proceeding from an unoccupied room, and were sometimes as of someone talking in a loud tone, sometimes as if some person were reading out loud, and occasionally as if screaming. The servants were, as may be imagined, in a great state of terror, and although they did not see anything, the cook one day informed Mrs. R. that in broad day she heard the rustle of a silk dress close behind her, now which seemed to touch her. But on turning suddenly round, thinking it was her mistress, she could not see anyone, much to her surprise and horror. Mrs. R.'s brother, a young officer addicted to field sports, and quite incredulous on the subject of ghostly visitations, was much disturbed and annoyed by these strange voices, which he asserted must be those of his sister and a lady friend of hers sitting up chatting at night. Twice, when a voice which he considered to resemble his sister's rose to a scream, he rushed to her bedroom between two and three o'clock in the morning, with a gun in his hand, but only to find her sleeping quietly. On the second Saturday in the above month of October, says our authority, Mrs. R. drove over to the railway station at Tunbridge to meet her friend, Miss S., whom she had invited to spend some weeks with her. This young lady had been in the habit of seeing apparitions, at times, from an early childhood. When, on their return at about four o'clock in the afternoon, they drove up to the entrance of the manor house. Miss S. perceived on the threshold the appearance of two figures, apparently an elderly couple habited in the costume of a former age. They appeared as if standing on the ground. She did not hear any voice, and not wishing to render her friend uneasy, she made at that time no remark to her in connection with this apparition. She saw the appearance of the same figures in the same dress several times within the next ten days sometimes in one of the rooms of the house, sometimes in one of the passages, always by daylight. They appeared to her surrounded by an atmosphere nearly of the color usually called neutral tint. On the third occasion, they spoke to her and stated that they had been husband and wife, that in former days they had possessed and occupied that manor house, and that their name was Children. They appeared sad and downcast, and when Miss S. inquired the cause of their melancholy, they replied that they had idolized this property of theirs, that their pride and pleasure had centered in its possession, that its improvement had engrossed their thoughts, and it troubled them to know that it had passed away from their family, and to see it now in the hands of careless strangers. To Miss S., the ghost seer, the voices of the apparitions were not only perfectly audible, but also intelligible. But it does not appear certain, so far as our record goes, that others who heard the conversing were enabled to comprehend what was said by the spirits. Meanwhile, Mrs. R., thinking that something unusual had occurred to her friends in connection with the household disturbances, questioned her on the subject and was then informed by Miss S. of what she had seen and heard from the apparitions. Hitherto, Mrs. R., though her rest had been disturbed by the frequent noises, had not seen anything, nor indeed had anyone save Miss S. But about a month after, the latter lady had had the interview with the specters, styling themselves Mr. and Mrs. Children, they made another optical manifestation. One day, Mrs. R., 
who had ceased to expect the appearance of the apparitions to herself, was hurriedly dressing for dinner. Her brother, to sight from Owen, who had just returned from a day's shooting, having called to her in impatient tones that dinner was served and that he was quite famished. At the moment of completing her toilet, and as she hastily turned to leave her bedchamber, not dreaming of anything spiritual, there in the doorway stood the same female figure Miss S. had described, identical in appearance and in costume, even to the old point lace on her brocaded silk dress, while beside her on the left, but less distinctly visible, was the figure of her husband. They uttered no sound, but above the figure of the lady, as if written in phosphoric light in the dusk atmosphere that surrounded her, were the words, Dame Children, together with some other words intimating that, having never aspired, Beyond the joys and sorrows of this world, she had remained earthbound. These last words Mrs. R. scarcely paused to decipher, for a renewed appeal from her brother as to whether they were to have any dinner that day urged her forward. The figure filling up the doorway remained stationary. There was no time for hesitation. She closed her eyes, rushed through the apparition and into the dining room, throwing up her hands and exclaiming to Miss S., Oh, my dear, I've walked through Mrs. Children. This was the only time Mrs. R. saw anything of the apparitions during her residence in the old manor house. Nor do they seem to have appeared again to anyone there, save Miss S. Mrs. R. had her bedroom not only lit up by a blazing fire, but also by candles whilst a lighted lamp kept burning in the corridor. Miss S., however, appears to have been honored with subsequent interviews by the apparitions, and from her conversations with them, learnt that the husband's name was Richard, and that he had died in 1753. She remarked that the costumes in which they appeared were of the period of Queen Anne, or of one of the early Georges. She could not be sure which, as the fashions in both were similar. Deeply impressed with the mystery that appertained to the old manor house, Mr. R. endeavored to elucidate it by making inquiries among the servants and in the neighborhood, but without success. No one knew that the house had ever been owned or inhabited by persons of the name Children, although a nurse in the family, Sophie O., had spent all her life in the vicinity. About four months afterward, and when her mistress had given up all hopes of unraveling the mystery, Sophie went home for a holiday to her father's at Riverhead, near Seven Oaks. During her visit, she called on a sister-in-law, an old woman of seventy, who fifty years previous had been housemaid in a family residing in Ramhurst Manor House. Sophie asked her old sister-in-law if she had ever heard of a family named Children living at the manor, and was informed that there was no such family there in her time. But she recollected having been informed by an old man that in his boyhood he had assisted to keep the hounds of the Children's who were then residing at Ramhurst. On her return, Sophie communicated this information to Mrs. R., who thus learnt that a family named Children had once really occupied the manor house, but beyond that she was unable to learn anything about them. In December 1858, Robert Dale Owen, being in the company of the two ladies referred to, Mrs. R. and Miss S., learnt all the particulars of the haunting and the apparitions already given. Having accepted an invitation to spend Christmas week with some friends living near Seven Oaks, he determined to prosecute further inquiries about the haunted manor and its former inhabitants in the neighborhood. He sought out Sophie and questioned her closely about the disturbances at the manor house during Mrs. R.'s residence, but was enabled to elicit little more than confirmatory evidence of what the reader knows already. Nor did his inspection of the churches and graveyards of Lye and Tunbridge afford him any fresh information about the Children family, save that a certain George Children left, 
in the year 1718, a weekly gift of bread to the poor, and that another George Children, his descendant, who had died about forty years previous, and who had not resided at Ramhurst, had a marble tablet in Tunbridge Church erected to his memory. Thus far, Mr. Owen had not obtained any further particulars of much value, but having been referred to the neighboring clergyman, by him he was left a document that contained the following extract from the Hasted Papers, which are preserved in the British Museum and may be consulted there. George Children, who was High Sheriff of Kent in 1698, died without issue in 1718, and by will devised the bulk of his estate to Richard Children, eldest son of his late uncle, William Children of Headcorn, and his heirs. This Richard Children, who settled himself at Ramhurst, in the parish of Lye, married Anne, daughter of John Saxby, in the parish of Leeds, by whom he had issue four sons and two daughters. Thus Mr. Owen had ascertained that the first of the children family who had occupied Ramhurst as a residence was named Richard, and that he settled there in the early part of George I's reign, but he was still ignorant of the date of his death, which, it will have been noted, was given by the apparition as 1753. Being referred by an antiquarian friend to Haste's History of Kent, published in 1778, he found the following paragraph. In the eastern part of the parish of Leith, now Lye, near the river Medway, stands an ancient mansion called Ramhurst, once reputed a manor and held of the honor of Gloucester. It continued in the Culpepper family for several generations. It passed by sale into that of Saxby, and Mr. William Saxby conveyed it by sale to children. Richard Children, Esquire, resided here and died possessed of it in 1753, aged 83 years. He was succeeded in it by his eldest son, John Children of Tunbridge, Esquire. Thus I verified, remarks Robert Dale Owen, the last remaining particular, the date of Richard Children's death. It appears from the above, also, that Richard Children was the only representative of the family who lived and died at Ramhurst his son John being designated not as of Ramhurst, but as of Tunbridge. From the private memoir above referred to, I had previously ascertained that the family seat after Richard's time was Pharaoh Hall, near Tunbridge. It remains to be added that in 1816, in consequence of events reflecting no discredit on the family, they lost all their property and were compelled to sell Ramhurst, which has since been occupied, though a somewhat spacious mansion, not as a family residence, but as a farmhouse. I visited it, and the occupants assured me that nothing worse than rats or mice disturb it now. Section 64. Russian Castle To mention many of the curious supernatural legends connected with the Castle of Russian in Castletown, Isle of Man, might only excite ridicule, and yet, belief in the wildest of them still lingers in the vicinity. Among other terrifying apparitions, which still, or until very recently, did haunt this ancient stronghold, is that of a woman who some years ago was executed for the murder of her child. The quantity and quality of the testimony adduced in collaboration of the appearance of this specter is absolutely startling. Many persons of good position and acknowledged veracity giving confirmatory evidence. Their united testimony is to the effect that an apparition of the executed woman frequently passes in and out of the castle gates when they are shut in the presence of the sentinels and other spectators. Indeed, it is alleged that the sight of this phantom has become quite familiar to them, but no one has yet had the courage to speak to it. Therefore, it has not been enabled to unfold the object of its appearance. 
In his quaint description of the island, Waldron gives the following curious tradition as connected with the venerable Manx castle. There is an apartment that has never been opened in the memory of man. The persons belonging to the castle are very cautious in giving any reason for it, it is alleged, but the natives unconnected with the castle aver that there is something supernatural in it, and tell you that formerly the place was inhabited by giants, who were dislodged by Merlin, and such as were not driven away are spellbound beneath the castle. In proof of this, they relate a very strange story, which is told by Waldron in these terms. They say there are a great many fine apartments underground, exceeding in magnificence any of the upper rooms. Several men, of more than ordinary courage, have, in former times, ventured down to explore the secrets of this subterranean dwelling place. But none of them ever returns to give an account of what they saw. It was therefore judged expedient that all the passages to it be continually shut, that no more might suffer by their temerity. About some fifty or fifty-five years since, a person possessed of uncommon boldness and resolution begged permission to visit these dark abodes. He, at length, obtained his request, went down, and returned by the help of a clue of pack thread which he took with him, which no man before had ever done, and brought this amazing discovery, that after he passed through a great number of vaults, he came into a long narrow place, which, the further he penetrated, he perceived that he went more and more on a descent, till having traveled as near as he could guess for the space of a mile, he began to see a gleam of light, which though it seemed to come from a vast distance, was the most delightful object he ever beheld. Having at length arrived at the end of that lane of darkness, he perceived a large and magnificent house illuminated with many candles, whence proceeded the light he had seen. Having, before he began the expedition, well fortified himself with brandy, he had courage enough to knock at the door, which, on the third knock, was opened by a servant, who asked him what he wanted. I would go as far as I can, replied our adventurer. Be so kind, therefore, as to direct me how to accomplish my design for I see no passage but that dark cavern through which I came. The servant told him he must go through that house, and accordingly led him through a long entry and out at a back door. He then walked a considerable way, till he beheld another house more magnificent than the first, and, all the windows being open, he discovered innumerable lamps burning in every room. Here also he designed to knock, but had the curiosity to step on a little bank which commanded a view of a low parlor. And looking in, he beheld a vast table in the middle of the room, and on it, extended at full length, a man, or rather a monster, at least fourteen feet long, and ten or twelve round the body. This prodigious fabric lay as if sleeping, with his head upon a book, with a sword by him, answerable to the hand which he supposed made use of it. The sight was more terrifying to our traveler than all the dark and dreary mansions through which he had passed. He resolved, therefore, not to attempt an entrance into a place inhabited by persons of such monstrous stature, and made the best of his way back to the other house. When the same servant who reconducted him informed him that if he had knocked at the second door, he would have seen company enough, but never would have returned, on which he desired to know what place it was, and by whom possessed. The other replied that these things were not to be revealed. He then took his leave, and by the same dark passage, got into the vaults, and soon afterwards, once more ascended to the light of the sun. Such is the marvelous legend told by the historian of Manxland, and he adds to it the statement that, Whoever seems to disbelieve it is looked on as a person of weak faith by the islanders, of course. Section 65, Surat, Hertfordshire. In that most curious collection of stories by Mrs. Crow, styled The Night Side of Nature, 
is recounted a marvelous narrative received from a professional gentleman resident in London. His relation is to this effect. I was, some few years since, invited to pass a day and night at the house of a friend in Hertfordshire, with whom I was intimately acquainted. His name was B., and he had formerly been in business as a saddler in Oxford Street, where he had realized a handsome fortune, and had now retired to enjoy his odium cum dignitate in the rural and beautiful village of Surat. It was a gloomy Sunday in the month of November, when I mounted my horse for the journey, and there was so much appearance of rain that I should certainly have selected some other mode of conveyance had I not been desirous of leaving the animal in Mr. B.'s straw yard for the winter. Before I got as far as St. John's Wood, the threatening clouds broke, and by the time I reached Watford, I was completely soaked. However, I proceeded, and arrived at Surat before my friend and his wife had returned from church. The moment they did so, they furnished me with dry clothes, and I was informed that we were to dine at the house of Mr. D., a very agreeable neighbor. I felt some little hesitation about presenting myself in such a costume, for I was decked out in a full suit of Mr. B.'s, who was a stout man of six feet in height, whilst I am rather of the diminutive order. But my objections were overruled. We went, and my appearance added not a little to the hilarity of the party. At ten o'clock, we separated, and I returned with Mr. and Mrs. B. to their house, where I was shortly afterwards conducted to a very comfortable bedroom. Fatigued with my day's ride, I was soon in bed, and soon asleep. But I do not think I could have slept long before I was awakened by the violent barking of dogs. I found that the noise had disturbed others as well as myself, for I heard Mr. B., who was lodged in the adjoining room, open his window and call to them to be quiet. They were obedient to his voice, and as soon as quietness ensued, I dropped to sleep again. But I was again awakened by an extraordinary pressure upon my feet. That I was perfectly awake, I declare. The light that stood in the chimney corner shone strongly across the foot of my bed, and I saw the figure of a well-dressed man in the act of stooping, and supporting himself in so doing by the bedclothes. He had on a blue coat with bright gilt buttons, but I saw no head. The curtains at the foot of the bed, which were partly looped back, just hung so as to conceal that part of his person. At first, I thought it was my host and as I had dropped my clothes, as is my habit, on the floor at the foot of the bed, I suppose he was come to look after them, which rather surprised me. But just as I had raised myself upright in bed, and was about to inquire into the occasion of his visit, the figure passed on. Then I recollected that I had locked the door, and becoming somewhat puzzled, I jumped out of bed, but I could see nobody and on examining the room I found no means of ingress but the door through which I had entered, and one other, both of which were locked on the inside. Amazed and puzzled, I got into bed again, and sat some time ruminating on the extraordinary circumstance when it occurred to me that I had not looked under the bed. So I got out again, fully expecting to find my visitor, whoever he was, there. But I was disappointed. So after looking at my watch and ascertaining that it was ten minutes past two, I stepped into bed again, hoping now to get some rest. But alas, sleep was banished for that night, and after turning from side to side and making vain endeavors at forgetfulness, I gave up the point and lay till the clock struck seven, perplexing my brain with the question of who my midnight visitor could be, and also how he had got in and how he had got out of my room. About eight o'clock, I met my host and his wife at the breakfast table, when, in answer to their hospitable inquiries of how I had passed the night, I mentioned first that I had been awakened by the barking of some dogs, and that I had heard Mr. B. open his window and call to them. He answered that two strange dogs had got into the yard and had disturbed the others. I then mentioned my midnight visitor, expecting that they would either explain the circumstance, or else laugh at me and declare I must have dreamt it. But, to my surprise, 
my story was listened to with grave attention. And they related to me the tradition with which this specter, for such I found they deemed it to be, was supposed to be connected. This was to the effect that many years ago a gentleman, so attired, had been murdered there under some frightful circumstances, and that his head had been cut off. On perceiving that I was very unwilling to accept this explanation of the mystery, for I had always been an entire disbeliever in supernatural appearances, they begged me to prolong my visit for a day or two, when they would introduce me to the rector of the parish who could furnish me with such evidence with regard to circumstance of a similar nature as would leave no doubt in my mind as to the possibility of their occurrence. But I had made an engagement to dine at Watford on my way back, and I confess, moreover, that after what I had heard, I did not feel disposed to encounter the chance of another visit from the mysterious stranger. So I declined the proffered hospitality and took my leave. Some time after this, I happened to be dining in C Street in company with some ladies resident in the same county, when, chancing to allude to my visit to Surat, I added that I had met with a very extraordinary adventure there, which I had never been able to account for. When one of these ladies immediately said that she hoped I had not had a visit from the headless gentleman in a blue coat and gilt buttons, who was said to have been seen by many people in that house. Such is the conclusion of this marvelous tale as regards myself, and I can only assure you that I have related facts as they have occurred, and I have never heard a word about this apparition in my life till Mr. B related to me the tradition above alluded to. Still, as I am no believer in supernatural appearances, I am constrained to suppose that the whole affair was the product of my imagination. Section 66, Scorrier House It seems impossible to explain away the well-vouched-for facts of the following marvelous historic incident by any theory of coincidence. The points of identity between the tragedy enacted afar off and the dreams in Cornwall are so many that the calculus of probabilities would scarcely include their agreement within the rules of the possible. And, if not by coincidence, by what law can the mystery be analyzed? It is not our task, however, to attempt to solve the problem, but to tell the story, basing our narrative upon the account which was given in the Times newspaper of August 16, 1868. It was on the night of the 11th of May, 1812, According to the version of the story told by the Times during the lifetime of Mr. Williams, that that gentleman, then residing at Scorrier House near Redruth in Cornwall, awoke his wife and in great agitation informed her that he had dreamed he was in the lobby of the House of Commons and had seen a man shoot with the pistol a gentleman who had just entered the lobby and who was said to be the Chancellor. Mrs. Williams very naturally replied that it was only a dream and endeavored to calm her husband by recommending him to go to sleep again. He did fall asleep again, but shortly afterwards awoke his wife and told her that he had had the same dream a second time. Upon this, Miss Williams suggested that he had been so disturbed by his former dream that it had probably dwelt on his mind and therefore begged him to try and compose himself and go to sleep, which he did. Once more, for the third time, the vision was repeated, whereupon, notwithstanding his wife's entreaties that he would be quiet and try to forget the affair, Mr. Williams arose and dressed himself, it then being between one and two o'clock in the morning. At breakfast, Mr. Williams' sole subject of conversation was the vivid dreams by which his night's rest had been disturbed. In the afternoon, he had occasion to go to Falmouth, where he gave every acquaintance he met particulars of his strange visions. The following day, Mr. Tucker of Tremonton Castle, accompanied by his wife, a daughter of Mr. Williams, visited at Scorrier House. No sooner were the family greetings over than Mr. Williams related his wonderful dream to the new arrivals, as Mrs. Williams laughingly remarked to her daughter. Her father would not even allow Mr. Tucker to be seated before he told him of his nocturnal visitation. Upon hearing his father-in-law's statement, Mr. Tucker observed that it might do very well in a dream to have the Chancellor in the lobby of the House of Commons, but that would never be found there in reality. Subsequently, Mr. Tucker inquired what sort of a man the person shot appeared to be, and when Mr. Williams described him with great minuteness, he remarked, Your description is not at all that of the Chancellor, but is certainly exactly that of Mr. Percival, the Chancellor of Exchequer, 
and although he has been to me the greatest enemy I ever met with for a supposed cause which had no foundation in truth or words to that effect, I should be exceedingly sorry indeed to hear of his being assassinated or of any injury of the kind happening to him. Mr. Tucker then asked Mr. Williams if he had ever seen Mr. Percival and was told that he never had seen him nor had ever even written to him, either on public or private matters. In short, that he had never had anything to do with him, nor had he ever been in the lobby of the House of Commons in his life. In the midst of this conversation, and whilst the two gentlemen were still standing, they heard a horse gallop up to the door of the house, and immediately afterwards, Mr. Michael Williams of Trevenor, son of Mr. Williams of Scorier, entered the room and said that he had galloped out from Truro, a distance of seven miles, having seen a gentleman there who had come by that evening's mail from London, who said that he was in the lobby of the House of Commons on the evening of the 11th, when a man named Bellingham had shot Mr. Percival, the Chancellor of Exchequer, and that, as it might occasion some great ministerial changes and might affect Mr. Tucker's political friends, he had come out as fast as he could to make him acquainted with it, having heard at Truro that he had passed through that place in the afternoon on his way to Squire House. After the astonishment which this unexpected fulfillment of the dream caused had a little subsided, Mr. Williams most particularly described the appearance and dress of the man whom he beheld in his dreams fire the pistol, as he had previously described Mr. Percival. Some six weeks after the fatal affair, Mr. Williams, having business in London, availed himself to the opportunity to go, accompanied by a friend, to the House of Commons, where, as has already been stated, he had never been before. As soon as he came to the steps at the entrance of the lobby, he stopped and said, This place is as distinctly within my recollection in my dream as any room in my house, and he repeated the observation when he entered the lobby. He then pointed out the exact spot where Bellingham stood when he fired, and which Mr. Percival had reached when he was struck by the ball, and where and how he fell. The dress and appearance of both Mr. Percival and his assassin Bellingham are declared to have agreed exactly, even to the most minute particular, with the descriptions given by Mr. Williams. The Times, when furnishing its readers with this wonderful story, drew attention to the fact that Mr. Williams was still alive and would therefore have denied any inaccuracy in their account, whilst many of the witnesses to whom he had made known the particulars of his dreams directly after he had had them were also living. Moreover, added the editor, he had received the whole statement from a correspondent of unquestionable veracity. Section 68. Soldern Rectory in the register of Brisley Church, Norfolk, against the 12th of December, 1706, stands the following words, which may serve as introduction to the extraordinary story we have to tell in connection with Soldern Rectory. I, Robert Withers, M.A. Vicar of Gately, do insert here a story which I had from undoubted hands, for I have all the moral certainty of the truth of it possible. The narrative referred to by Mr. Withers is as given in the following sentences, but not in the precise words of that gentleman as they only furnish a very abridged account of the mysterious affair besides deviating slightly from the more circumstantial and exact particulars given in the private correspondence subsequently published in the gentleman's magazine which passed between the rev john hughes of jesus college cambridge the learned editor of st christostom on the priesthood and the rev mr bonway very shortly after the events referred to took place mr hughes who derived his information from mr grove public register of the cambridge university and the intimate friend of mr shaw writes thus the rev mr shaw formerly fellow of st john's college cambridge and subsequently rector of soldern and college living within twelve miles of oxford on the night of the twenty first of july seventeen o six was sitting by himself smoking a pipe and reading when he observed somebody open the door and turning round was astounded to see the appearance of mr naylor formerly his fellow collegian at st john's and his intimate friend but who had been dead fully five years the apparition came into the room garbed apparently in exactly the same clothes and in exactly the same manner as mr naylor had been accustomed to at the university mr shaw was of course intensely amazed but asserted that he was not much affrighted and after a little while recollecting himself desired his visitor to sit down this the apparition of mr naylor did drawing the chair up to his old friend and sitting by him they then had a conference of upwards of an hour and a half during which the visitor informed mr shaw that he had been sent to give his old friend warning of his death which would be very soon and very sudden 
The apparition also mentioned several others of St. John's, particularly the famous orchard whose deaths were at hand. Mr. Shaw asked him if he could not give him another visit, but he said no, as his, the apparition's, allotted time was but three days, and that he had others to visit who were at great distances apart. Mr. Shaw had an intense desire to inquire about the apparition's present condition, but was afraid to mention it, not knowing how it would be taken. At last he expressed himself in this manner. Mr. Naylor, how is it with you in the other world? He, the apparition, answered with a brisk and cheerful countenance. Very well. Mr. Shaw proceeded to ask, Are there any of our old friends with you? Not one, responded he, but Orchard will be with me soon, and you not long after. After this discourse, the apparition took its leave and went out. Mr. Shaw offered to accompany it out of the room, but it beckoned with its hand that he should stay where he was, and seeming to turn into the next room, disappeared. The next day Mr. Shaw made his will, and not very long after being seized with an apoplectic fit while he was reading service in church, he fell out of the desk and died almost immediately. He was ever looked upon as a pious man and a good scholar, says Mr. Hughes, who had the story of the apparition from Mr. Grove, a particular friend of Mr. Shaw, and who, being on a visit to Soldern soon after the event, had the whole particulars from the minister's own lips. Mr. Grove returned to Cambridge soon after, and meeting with one of his college, was told that Mr. Arthur Orchard was dead. On the 21st of January, 1707, the Reverend M. Turner, writing to the Reverend Mr. Bonwick, with reference to the story, says, There is a circumstance relating to the apparition, which adds a great confirmation to it, which I suppose Mr. Hughes did not tell you. There is one Mr. Cartwright, a member of Parliament, a man of good credit and integrity, an intimate friend of Mr. Shaw, who told the same story with Dr. Grove, which he had from Mr. Shaw at the Archbishop of Canterbury's table. But he says further that Mr. Shaw told him of some great revolutions in states which he won't discover, being either obliged to silence by Mr. Shaw or concealing them upon some prudent and polite reason. Mr. Shaw, may be added, had been a noted enemy to a belief in apparitions and in company was accustomed to inveigh against any credence being placed in them, but after his presumed interview with the apparition of his old friend, spoke of that in such a way with his more intimate acquaintances as quite convinced them of his belief in its spirituality, one of whom the Reverend Richard Chamber, vicar of Soppington, Shropshire, wrote out an account still extant of the affair as related to him by Mr. Shaw. End of section 68. Section 69. Spedlin's Tower. This ancient fortress bore the reputation for a long number of years of being haunted by the spirit of a certain man known in the flesh as Porteus. The story of this haunting has been frequently told by Gross, the antiquary, and other well-known writers, and the truth of the events about to be recorded has been most emphatically asserted by persons of respectability and credit. Indeed, many a ghost story passes current that has not had such corroborative evidence as this tale of antique lore. Bedlin's Tower, which stands on the southwest bank of the Annan in the time of Charles the Second, was in the possession of Sir Alexander Jardin of Applegarth. At one time, the baronet had confined in the dungeon of his tower a miller named Porteus, who was suspected, truthfully or not, cannot be known of having set fire willfully to his own premises the alleged object tradition does not condescend to inform us sir alexander jardine soon after this man's incarceration was suddenly called away to edinburgh and carrying the keys of the dungeons with him forgot or disregarded his prisoner until he was passing through the west port when it has been suggested perhaps the sight of the warder's keys brought to his mind his own he sent back immediately a courier to liberate the unfortunate man but porteus had in the meantime perished of hunger no sooner was he dead than his ghost began to torment the household and no rest was to be had within spedlin's tower by day or by night in this dilemma sir alexander according to old use and wont summoned a whole legion of ministers to his aid and by their strenuous efforts porteus was at length confined to the scene of his mortal agonies where however he continued to scream occasionally at night let me out let me out for i am dying o oh, hunger he also used to flutter against the door of the vault and was always sure to remove the bark from any twig that was sportively thrust through the keyhole the spell which thus compelled the spirit to remain in bondage was attached to a large black-lettered bible used by the exorcist and afterwards deposited in a stone niche which still remains on the walls of the staircase and it is certain that after the lapse of many years when the family repaired to a newer mansion jardine hall built on the other side of the river the bible was left behind to keep the restless spirit in order 
on one occasion indeed the volume requiring to be rebound was sent to edinburgh but the ghost getting out of the dungeon and crossing the river made such a disturbance in the new house hauling the baronet and his lady out of bed and committing other annoyances that the bible was recalled before it reached edinburgh and replaced in its former situation the good woman who told gross this story in seventeen eighty eight declared that should the bible again be taken off the premises no consideration whatever should induce her to remain there a single night but the charm seems to be now broken or the ghost must have become either quiet or disregarded for the old bible has been removed and it is now kept at jardine hall section seventy shusher manse although the name of the person chiefly concerned in the following narrative is concealed under the initial s the reference to the house where he had his remarkable vision and the fact that it was then occupied by a relative of the gallant captain will afford sufficient means of identification to the curious premising this it will now suffice to say that some few years ago captain s was spending a single night in the manse of stresher in argleshire this residence was then in the occupation of some relations of the captain and so far as is known had not at the time the reputation of being haunted soon after the weary guest had retired to rest the curtains of the bed were open and somebody looked in upon him supposing it to be some inmate of the house who was not aware that the bed was occupied the captain took no notice of the circumstance till it being two or three times repeated he at length said what do you want why do you disturb me in this manner i come replied a voice to tell you that this day twelve month you will be with your father after this captain s was no more disturbed in the morning he related the circumstance to his host but being an entire disbeliever in all spiritual phenomena without attaching any importance to the warning in the natural course of events and quite irrespective of his visitation on that day twelvemonth he was again at the manse of stresher on his way to the north for which purpose it was necessary that he should cross the ferry of craigie the day was however so exceedingly stormy that his friend begged him not to go but he pleaded his business adding that he was determined not to be withheld with this intention by the ghost and although the minister delayed his departure by engaging him in a game of backgammon he at length started up declaring he could stay no longer they therefore proceeded to the water but found the boat was moored to the side of the lake and the boatman assured them that it would be impossible to cross captain s however insisted and as the old man was firm in his refusal he became somewhat irritated and laid his cane lightly across his shoulders it ill becomes you sir said the ferryman to strike an old man like me but since you will have your way you must i cannot go with you but my son will but you will never reach the other side he will be drowned and you too the boat was then set afloat and captain s together with his horse and servant and the ferryman's son embarked in it the distance was not great but the storm was tremendous and having with great difficulty got halfway across the lake it was found impossible to proceed the danger of tacking was of course considerable but since they could not advance there was no alternative but to turn back and it was resolved to attempt it the manoeuvre however failed the boat capsized and they were all precipitated into the water you keep hold of the horse i can swim said captain s to his servant when he saw what was about to happen being an excellent swimmer and the distance from the shore inconsiderable he hoped to save himself but he had on a heavy top coat with boots and spurs the coat he strived to take off in that water and then struck out with confidence but alas the coat had got entangled with one of the spurs and as he swam it clung to him getting heavier and heavier as it became saturated with water even dragging him beneath the stream he however reached the shore where his anxious friend still stood watching the event and as the latter bent over him he was just able to make a gesture with his hand which seemed to say you see it was to be and then expired the boatman was also drowned but by the aid of the horse the servant escaped section seventy one taunton stories of haunted houses and ghostly tales are very prevalent in the western counties somersetshire is especially rich in these things and one of the most suggestive accounts of the many which have appeared in the pages of notes and queries relates to this county mr t westwood who furnished the following narrative to the above publication gave it as a faithful report so far as he was concerned and we reproduce it in the words of our authority in the year eighteen forty i was detained for several months in the sleepy old town of taunton my chief associate during the time was a fox-hunting squire a bluff hearty genial type of his order with just sufficient intellectuality to temper his animal exuberance many were our merry rides along the thorps and hamlets of pleasant somersetshire 
and it was one of these excursions, while the evening sky was like molten copper, and a fiery March wind coursed like a racehorse over the open downs, that he related to me the story of what he called his luminous chamber. Coming back from the hunt after dark, he said he had frequently observed a central window in an old hall not far from the roadside, illuminated. All the other windows were dark, but from this one a one dreary light was visible, and as the owners had deserted the place, and he knew it had no occupant, the lighted window became a puzzle to him. On one occasion, having a brother squire with him, and both carrying good store of port wine under their girdles, they declared they would solve the mystery of the luminous chamber then and there. The lodge was still tenanted by an aged porter. Him they roused up, and after some delay, having obtained a lantern and the keys of the hall, they proceeded to make their entry. Before opening the great door, however, my squire revered he had made careful inspection of the front of the house from the lawn. Sure enough, the central window was illuminated. An eerie, forlorn-looking light made it stand out in contrast to the rest, a dismal light that seemed to have nothing in common with the world, or the life, that is. The two squires visited all the other rooms, leaving the luminous room till last. There was nothing noticeable in any of them, they were totally obscure. But on entering the luminous room, a marked change was perceptible. The light in it was not full, but sufficiently so beneath them to distinguish its various articles of furniture, which were common and scanty enough. What struck them most was the uniform diffusion of the light. It was as strong under the table as on the table, so that no single object projected any shadow on the floor, nor did they themselves project any shadow. Looking into a great mirror over the mantelpiece, nothing could be weirder, the squire declared, than the reflection in it of the dim, one-lighted chamber, and of the two awe-stricken faces that glared on them from the midst, his own and his companions. He told me, too, that he had not been many seconds in the room before a sick faintness stole over him, a feeling, such was his expression, I remember, as if his life were being sucked out of him. His friend owned afterwards to a similar sensation. The upshot of it was that both squires decamped crestfallen and made no further attempt at solving the mystery. It had always been the same, the old porter grumbled. The family had never occupied the room, but there were no ghosts. The room had a light of its own, a less sceptical spirit might have opined that the room was full of ghosts, an awful conclave, viewless, inscrutable, but from whom emanated that deathly and deadly luminousness. My squires must have gone the way of all squires ere this. After life's fitful fever, do they sleep well? Or have they both been sucked into the luminous medium as a penalty for their intrusion? End of section 71